to um, uh, to be speaking to you today, uh, uh, to have been invited by the Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council of Ottawa in the presence of uh, our of your distinguished guests, the High Commissioner of India and the President of Carleton University, and a particular privilege uh, to share virtually, though it may be, a stage with Professor Carson. Uh, now, what I want to do today is to say something about Gandhi's um, thoughts on race, uh, but to approach this, these thoughts as it were from what appears to be their opposite, uh, from the idea of humanity. We normally tend to contrast racism or race thinking and race identity with humanity and humanitarianism as being a somehow more universal form of inclusive identity. Um, but this contrast actually bears some reflection and Gandhi, uh, typically of him, subjected this contrast to sustained reflection. And I'd, I'd like to say a few words about it. Uh, now, to begin with, of course, the idea of humanity was important for Gandhi because it was also part of the ideological repertoire of imperialism. The British Empire presented itself in a humanitarian guise. Uh, and advanced its practices in places like India as a humanitarian gift, creating an obligation among its subjects. Uh, the thing about this gift, of course, is that it set aside any idea of contract or of agreement uh, or indeed of conversation to say nothing of acquiescence. The gift was unilateral because Indian subjects were unable to engage in any conversation with the British Raj uh, and were not deemed to be its equals. Uh, indeed, the British Raj often presented itself by a logic of what today we might call humanitarian intervention. And this logic went back indeed to the abolition of slavery by Britain uh, itself, uh, you may know that in the aftermath of that abolition, the Royal Navy uh, was tasked with breaking what at that time was international law by seizing suspected slave cargo on the high seas in an act precisely of humanitarian intervention. Uh, clearly a virtuous act, but one that was at the same time uh, joined up with other acts such as bombardments uh, of colonial territories uh, and other forms of very violent intervention, which were also given the name of humanitarianism. Uh, so when Gandhi started to think about nonviolence, he had to deal with this ideology of humanity and humanitarianism, not least because it was so characteristic of the self-justification of imperialism. Uh, and imperialism, to repeat, uh, that was premised upon a gift given by Britain, in this case, to her subjects in other parts of the world, a gift that was not uh, about contract, about agreement, about uh, certainly about democracy. Now, what Gandhi tried to do in his early uh, activism in South Africa was to reverse this obligation that was created supposedly by the gift of empire. And we know that he did this in his ambulance course in the Boer War uh, uh, of the late 19th century and the so-called Zulu War, otherwise known as the Bambata Rebellion uh, in the early, uh, both in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries where he, he leads Indian volunteers uh, in these ambulance corps. Uh, who, and these volunteers are meant to take care of both sides, uh, uh, wounded men on both sides uh, of the political rift. Uh, and this was a, an example of a unilateral gift. Uh, 
a gift given back to the empire to create an obligation among the British themselves. Uh, so it was an attempt to turn British humanitarian ideology on its head, as it were. Yet, even as he was doing this, Gandhi was deeply suspicious of the language of humanity and what had become uh, of it in imperialism. So as early as his uh, fundamental text in the Swaraj or Indian Home Rule of 1909, Gandhi criticizes the idea of humanity. Uh, he thinks that speaking in the name of humanity, speaking for the human race, was simply a sign of pride and hubris. How could any nation or person or world leader claim to speak on behalf of this vast concourse of people uh, without any representative capacity? He also saw this hubris as coming out of a sense of um, uh, capitalist technology, uh, which is what allowed the British to conquer different parts of the world uh, and to claim, therefore, to speak on behalf of those uh, who had become their subjects. Uh, he also understood this form of speaking in the name of humanity uh, or for it uh, as, a, a, as a practice that sacrificed necessarily means for ends. Uh, and the High Commissioner, I think, has already mentioned to us how Gandhi was so intent on the virtue of means, which should not be sacrificed uh, to ends. Uh, whereas when you think of humanity in a purely biological or demographic way, as a sheer number and scale of population, then you might be tempted to sacrifice smaller numbers for larger ones. And this, of course, Gandhi was very critical of. So in all of these ways, he took an idea, the idea of humanity, and a practice, the practice of humanitarianism, and tried to disentangle them from the way in which they had become embroiled in imperial and imperialist enterprises. In the past, of course, ideas such as that of humanity had been defined not in demographic or biological terms at all. Uh, being human had been defined in philosophical and moral and religious terms. Uh, whether these had to do with compassion or sacrifice or doing one's duty. Uh, but these pre-modern ideas of defining the human uh, were by the late 19th century subordinated to biological and demographic ones of the kind that I have tried to describe. Um, and for Gandhi, this was particularly disturbing because he thought it made humanity uh, partake of the same logic as racism. So the very categories that are meant to be opposed to one another ended up looking very much alike. How was this? Because like racism, the idea of humanity in its modern incarnation and imperialist form tended to be defined by similarity and similitude, right? Uh, where uh, a human being is defined as someone who shares something biological very often uh, with others who are defined as human beings, uh, who these figures are meant to share a language, they are meant to communicate with each other, and language or communication, of course, is one of the crucial definitions of the human. Um, they are meant to share food, of course, they are meant to share sexual relations. Now, all of these are biological relations. And Gandhi is very disturbed by them because he understands, uh, as I suggested just now, that this is simply racism writ large that if you define humanity in purely bio biological terms as a set of similarities and similitudes, then what really is the difference between racial identity, which is simply a narrow version of this kind of human uh, identity? What does he do? He contrasts this way of thinking about humanity uh, to a non-biological one, one that is not premised upon similarity and similitude. Uh, and he calls this other way of thinking 
about the human humanitarianism, but humanitarianism of a very different kind than humanitarian intervention. And one of the places, one of the sites in which he does this is when thinking about interspecies relations, relations between human beings and non-human life. Uh, the occasion, of course, for Gandhi to approach these relations was, uh, had to do with the sacredness of animal life in Hinduism in particular, and the figure of the sacred cow uh, specifically. And what Gandhi does is he says that the sacredness of the cow and the sacredness of non-human life and of all human life indeed, uh, is premised upon a logic that is not a biological logic, that is not about similarity and similitude, because how can you conceive of relations between humans and non-humans? They do not share a language. They do not, are not part of the same food ecology, and they do not share sexual and reproductive relations. Their relations in many ways are non-biological. They are biological in some indirect ways, of course, because cattle and other domesticated animals support human life. Uh, so for Gandhi, it was the relations between human and non-human life that served as the truer model for humanitarianism, precisely because they're made for relations that are not defined by similarity and similitude and that are not biological, but indeed are moral. Um, and for him, it was these relations uh, that were called humanitarian because they allowed humanity to actually go beyond itself. Uh, this is a way of thinking about the human, which is not about uh, defining everyone within the same. It's about opening up. It's about opening to the other, opening to the outside. Um, and for him, this served as by far the most productive way of thinking about uh, both human relations and relations among human beings and non-human life. Now, of course, this way of thinking entailed another kind of unilateralism. You know, the British Empire's unilateralism was that it offered itself as a gift ostensibly to its subjects. For Gandhi, human and non-human relations were also offered as a gift. Uh, because you couldn't really know what the animal wanted. You didn't share a language with the animal. Uh, they were defined these relations, therefore, by duty. Duty as an obligation of a very different kind than that the British Empire uh, uh, conceived of. Right? So for the British Empire, its humanitarian acts created or were meant to create an obligation among its subjects. Uh, for Gandhi, the obligation was not a return. So you did your duty by non-human life and indeed by human life, but you did not expect a return gift as it were. You did not expect the animal to have an obligation towards you. Your duty was unilateral in that sense. Uh, and he went further uh, to speculate uh, or to reflect, I should say philosophically, on the virtue of duty. Now, I want to end with that because we tend to think of humanity and humanitarianism in the language of rights. Um, Gandhi was much more interested in the language of duty. Dharma is the Sanskrit word for it, uh, but you can just as well use the English one. Uh, and let me, let me give you an example of this. So in 1948, or you know, around the end of 1947, uh, 40, 1947, of course, marks the independence of India and the partition of British India, uh, Gandhi receives a letter from Julian Huxley, uh, who was at that time director of UNESCO. And uh, Julian Huxley is writing to Gandhi. He writes to many eminent figures because he is part of the drafting committee of a document that eventually becomes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with, with the United Nations. And Huxley asks Gandhi what he thinks about rights and Gandhi writes back to him and says, 
he doesn't think much of them actually because you cannot conceive of rights without duties uh, those two things are paired um, rights gandhi suggests are in fact never inalienable uh, they are always given by states uh, and therefore they can be taken away by states even though we call them inalienable duties on the other hand are truly individual they belong to each one of us we ought to know what our what our duties are and we ought to fulfill those duties no one can take away your duty now just as rights are defined by life because the primary right of course is the right to life and gandhi clearly would have been for this uh, but for gandhi more important in some ways was duty because the primary duty is the duty to die sacrifice uh, so there are many rights of course there there are rights to habitation and to food uh, and to employment uh, and the right to life is only the most basic but also uh, the if you will most supreme of rights similarly with duties uh, which are sacrificial in nature there are many kinds of duties uh, the duties to your families to your loved ones to your neighbors to your uh, fellow citizens uh to animals as gandhi would argue uh but the primary duty of course is the duty to give your own life uh in a moral cause and for gandhi it was duty that was crucial uh and i there is another anecdote i would like to end with uh, this time from 1937 in 1937 uh you have uh, someone called rudolf von strunk who comes to see gandhi in Segao, I think, uh, at Varda, at his ashram. And Rudolf von Strunk is a Nazi. Uh, he had been responsible for supplying arms to the fascists in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and he came to see Gandhi because he was interested in issues precisely of life uh, and of health. Uh, the Nazis were very interested in life and health, though only the life and health of their own race. Um, and when he speaks to Gandhi, Gandhi says to him, look at the violence of the Spanish Civil War. And von Strunk says, yes, isn't it terrible? And Gandhi says, no, you don't understand me. Uh, what's objectionable about the Spanish Civil War is not the fact that you give up your lives. That is actually wonderful that you're capable of doing that. And we Indians should learn from you what is truly objectionable is not giving up your life what is truly objectionable is the fact that you kill while doing so that you kill others and you kill others because you value life more that killing is about killing others of course is linked to protecting or promoting your own lives and the lives of those you conceive of as people like you in other words, in the case of the Nazis, of course, the so-called Aryan race. And it is that which is truly objectionable. If you give up your desire for life and for the promotion of life and for the promotion of, li of lives of those who are like you, uh, then you can open yourself up to nonviolence. Uh, and that truly is virtue. So that there is something deeply problematic in the valorization of life in this manner. And therefore it is duty and sacrifice uh, that defines what nonviolence uh, is. And oddly, paradoxically for Gandhi, it was duty and duty is always sacrificial. And the primary sacrifice of course is inevitably death. It is that which is more capable of protecting life than the ideology of protecting life itself. So let me end here uh, uh, by suggesting that when Gandhi thinks about race and racial identity, he does so by approaching it from what is ostensibly its opposite, the category of humanity and of humanitarianism. Uh, and we, when we trace his thinking, we come to what appears to be a rather paradoxical set of conclusions, but ones that I think really merit our continued attention because they allow us to rethink both these terms.
uh, and to understand that race and humanity are curiously intertwined with one another at an, in order to make a truly nonviolent life possible, a non-racist life, we need to disentangle them very, very carefully. And that is something that Gandhi himself did uh, throughout his career. Thank you.